So as I was looking at different verses on this World Communion Sunday, I went to one of my favorite books of the Bible, which is Philippians. It's one of the verses I gave the children a couple of weeks ago. There are many verses to choose from, but there's a particularly interesting passage that stands out, has one sentence of particular importance to me. And it's amazing because this book is called the Epistle of Joy. But he's writing from prison, probably in Rome, probably a potential death sentence. And yet this is a, an epistle of joy. He had founded the church earlier years, and um, the Philippians were worried about him, knowing that he was in jail. And so they sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to go give Paul a gift in jail, some supplies, and to check up on him. And so Paul has written this letter and given it to Epaphroditus to take back to the Philippian church. And so we'll look in verse two, uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary, if, if it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, but, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we do give thanks for this word to us. We pray that your spirit would help us to understand better, not just what Paul is telling us, but what your spirit is putting on our hearts, that we might learn also how to profess our faith in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so it's called the age of accelerations. Have you ever heard of that term? The age of accelerations. Well, you should because... You and I are living right in the middle of it, and you will hear about it. It was a quote that was given to us last week by Tom Toole, our wonderful Carson Lecture minister from Atlanta. He was quoting a book that just came out by Friedman, the New York columnist, called Thank You for Being Late. And he quotes Friedman, to understand the 21st century, you need to understand that the planet's three greatest forces, technology, globalization, and climate change, are accelerating all at once. Technology, globalization, and climate change. They're accelerating all at once. And it was so intriguing to me, I've already bought the book and I'm about a third of the way through it. 
He argues that you and I are living in one of the greatest inflection points in world history. What's an inflection point? Let me put it in perspective. He says it can be argued that the last worldwide inflection point was provided by a German blacksmith named Johann Gutenberg, who in his invention of the printing press created a, a printing revolution in all of Europe, which also fueled the way for the Protestant Reformation, which, by the way, we will celebrate this month at the end of the month, as much of the world has been celebrating for the whole year of the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's input. Now, people like dates, and we say that on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the chapel door of the castle of Wittenberg. Well, we know the Reformation was going on 100 years before that. In fact, we're going to be writing a little bit about Did You Know all month in the Highland Heartbeat to try to help us understand the importance of the Reformation in our lives as Protestants, as Presbyterians, as Christians. But I wonder if historians in the future will look back and that they will point to and tout a particular date as another inflection point. January 9th, 2007. Remember that day? January 9th, 2007. Anybody want to make a guess of what happened on that day? Anybody? Got it. Steve Jobs went up on stage like he had done before, and he said, we are reinventing the mobile phone. Did you get it? Good. He said, we will have the world's best media player, the world's best telephone, and the world's best way to get to the web, all three in one. No buttons. It'll all be done on software, and it will be called a smartphone. How many have a phone in their pocket right now? Raise your hand. How many think that phone is smarter than they are? Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, this is only 10 years ago. Only 10 years ago. I was having lunch. Uh, ben Pimber and I were having lunch on Thursday. And we were, there must have been about 40 people around us. And we looked around the room thinking, who in this room doesn't have a phone on them? Now, whether it's an Apple or whatever, it's a, it's a smartphone, most of them. There are still some flip phones that aren't hooked to the web, but they're, who doesn't have a phone in this world? Now, a lot of things happened in 2007, and, you know, it's hard for me to think that, gosh, I lived through this and didn't even realize all this was happening. Facebook went from being a college campus where you had per, um, social media where you had to sign that you were over 13 years old. Remember that? And it became public for all usage. Twitter came out. Airbnb came out at that time. Amazon introduced this little thing called Kindle that you see all over the place right now. The world is being transformed through technology, globalization, and climate change right before our eyes. And these changes are accelerating exponentially. The age of acceleration, so that's where it's coming from. What do I mean by that? What Friedman said was, in 1900, it took about 20 to 30 years for technology to take one step big enough that the world became uncomfortably different. Think about the introduction of cars or the airplane. 20 to 30 years. 
nowadays, that is down to five to seven years from the time something is introduced to the time it's ubiquitous. Think smartphone. Five to seven years. We are living in a society that is accelerating so flat, fast that if you're like me, you'd like to go find the pause button and punch it. Friedman says, when you take time to pause and reflect, and I'm quoting here of this New York columnist, when you take time to hit the pause button and reflect, you start to connect with your most deeply held beliefs. And then this real interesting quote from a friend of his. When, the, when you press the pause button on a machine, it stops. But when you press the pause button on human beings, they start. Think about what that implies. In fact, the title of the book, Thanks for Being Late, was he was at a lunch and a friend was late to come and he was sitting there and he was thinking, wow, this is the first time in a while that I've had time to pause and reflect. So when the guy came up and said, oh, I'm so sorry, he said, no, 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 thanks for being late. It allowed me to pause because we don't build that in our schedule to sit there and reflect. Worship allows us to pause and reflect, especially during the sacrament of communion, but especially on this World Communion Sunday. With unprecedented tragedies, one after the other these past weeks, let us pause and reflect on what really matters in life. So many times I find myself complaining about the most minuscule things. I know you're probably not like this. The Wi-Fi is down and I can't check my emails. This is serious stuff. Or I go get a cup of coffee and they're out of the good stuff and they have just the decaf. Now, what matters most in life? Isn't it just the perspective to which you come to it? I love Fred Craddock, the wonderful Methodist minister who shares a story about a missionary friend who spent most of his life in China. They'd been there many years and they were actually in the last several years were under house arrest. And then one day the soldier came to them and said, you can now return to America. And they were celebrating and thought, this is great. He said, you can only take, though, 200 pounds with you. I said, okay, 200 pounds. They've been there for several years. So they get out the scales, and they get the family, the two children, the wife, and the husband, they all get together figuring out, well, what's the important? The wife says, this Chinese vase has to go, and, and the husband says, well, what about my books? They've got to go, and they have all this stuff in there. It's over 200 pounds. They start taking things off. They weigh again. It's still over 200. They take some more things off. They weigh again right down to the very dot, 200 pounds. Then the soldier comes back, ready to go? Yes. Did you weigh everything? Yes. Did you weigh the kids? No. Weigh the kids. And in a moment, vase and books become trash. It's all a matter of perspective. What really matters? In prison with possible death sentence, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's like he's saying, don't worry about me. My life is devoted to Jesus Christ. So if being faithful to him means that I have to be in chains, that's fine with me. And if they should kill me, that's fine too. I will receive eternal life and be with him forever. In the midst of these accelerated changes or unprecedented tragedies, what matters most? 
Most of us sitting here this morning have frustrations or little irritations like Wi-Fi or wrong coffee. Sometimes daily doses. Many of us get to know words like sickness, accident, misfortune, injury, surgery, catastrophe, pain, hurt. Unfortunately, up close and personal, we get to know them. And some of us face personal tragedies. The difficult depression that follows a marital breakup. The death of a loved one. The self-destructive behavior of one of our children. The terror of life-threatening illness. Or something else equally weighty. In these uncertainties and unexpected changes that life throws at us, Paul gives us words to keep our perspective a long perspective. And though legal documents still call them acts of God, when a hurricane or earthquake or other non-human caused natural event happens, even in the midst of pain, death, displacement, and loss, God's love does not change. As Paul says in another wonderful statement of faith, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the message that Paul's willing to bet his life on. And that's the message that you and I can also. So let's take time to, to pause and reflect. Push the button. Take time to profess our own thankfulness here at a table of thanksgiving. Take time to declare our unity through our continued prayers and support for our many brothers and sisters, sisters throughout the world who are in dire need. In 1940, at the brink of World War II, churches worldwide gathered together because they needed to share with the world a spiritual message of unity. And now, 77 years later, we need that same message. Today, in many parts of the world, there'll be Christians in magnificent cathedrals, open country churches, mud that sheds, lean-to shacks, all partaking in the communion the sacrament of communion. But in some areas of Texas, Florida, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and other Caribbean islands, a heart-wrenching number of Christians will not even be able to gather where they were worshiping last week because it's been destroyed by hurricanes and earthquakes. Yet despite that, they will gather pause and reflect, to profess their faith in what is important, to give thanks, to pray, to once again hear the invitation of our Lord Jesus Christ to a hurting world to come to this table, to come, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And so as part of our prayer so support, John Cheke, would you come forward and ask John. He's, uh, as you'll hear in a minute, a wonderful prayer and a seminary intern for us. But I asked him if he would lead us in a special uh, time of prayers of intercession for world communion. Thank you, John. 